Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So this video, I suppose, is a a sequel, in a sense, to the ontology of games, which I made previously, which people seem to quite enjoy. Building upon that, I want to take a lot of the content, a lot of the, really the fundamental vision that I presented there regarding what games represent, ontologically speaking. That is not just as an artifact of human civilization, but as part of existence itself. And I want to abstract that and also begin a new dialogue about what life is. This is something we do not think about, right? What is the ontology of life? What does our 70 year span on Earth actually mean in terms of existence? Is this a mere blip inside of the long span of existence? Well, it's not a very adequate answer because how did it start to begin with? <clears throat> Where does the actual stream of consciousness start? How does it start? Whatever starts should come to an end. Okay, but what does that start end interval actually mean in existence? And this relates to, you know, well, what is the fundamental purpose of life? And how would we possibly find that out? And this is what I touched upon in that video. That if we understand life as a game, actually makes a lot of sense. Um, the quick summary of that video is just to say that, well, any game, even a complex one like some, something like Minecraft, ultimately is an emanation a simulation, a holographic projection from some source code. And relatively speaking, the source code is infinitely more simple than the actual end product. It's a finite set of strings and it produces a lot of complexity. Now, this idea is the reason why we can do this with games, we can make Minecraft, whatever, is because this idea that there's a mathematical code which generates something bigger, in fact, that whatever is, whatever exists, has been generated by some source code. The reason why this makes sense is because the universe itself is based upon this principle. Everything in the universe has an underlying code, right? Like the mathematical laws which govern physics. Light itself is a simulation which is generated by, we might say, Maxwell's equations. These lines of code which in, in the matrix of the universe, which is generating this phenomenon of light. And so for everything, there's a code, there's an archetype, to use a profound word, is a logos, an archetypal reality. And that's what the word of God means. This idea, this biblical idea that God speaks things into existence. God says be, and it is. Right? We say in, in Python or whatever, I put in a code, I say be, I say run, the code runs, and boom, you, you, you get the actual program, the actual simulation. It's a metaphysical principle. And it's of note that what this thing is, is fundamentally linguistic, logical in nature. Even the world, as deeply as we probe into the world, as deeply as we probe into reality, we discover, we cognize, we create technology, we blast rockets into space. Reality bounces back. The more deeply we press in, the more it speaks back to us and it screams out that it is logically organized. As far as we research, the more and more we understand the world, the more logical it is. There's nothing which is not, does not have a logical principle which, is, which it is based upon. And this logical principle, the word logic from the Greek word logos, fundamentally means speech, human speech, because 
at a very deep level, language is consciousness. That consciousness is there in reality. The more we study reality, the more we experience it. It seems that the fundamental reality behind reality is logically, is, is conscious logic. But coming to our, our matter in a very literal sense, it is clear, and this is a very profound, both spiritual and philosophical exercise, to know thyself, to examine the self, which is clear in, in our self-examination that, well, well, firstly, let, let's, let's take the body. We live in an age where, in a very physical age, an age in which the body, the human body is really um, taken as the absolute parameter, taken as, you know, the, the last, the, 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 the fundamental purpose, right? Or the fundamental substance of our existence is bodily existence. So we are most obsessed in this modern age, I think more than any other age, with the body, the bodily development, with how we look. In an age of Instagram, we are incredibly self-conscious about how, how we look and changing how we look and, and all these things. But, and we're also very conscious in this age of how our, our, our body, our physical image and all these things, in a large part determines our life. And it is true, especially in understanding that even our talents and our abilities, even our intelligence, largely is bodily determined, right? Intelligence isn't some distinct thing where, you know, some people are great in sports and some people are really intelligent. It doesn't really work like that. Unfortunately, it's usually the case that, and there, there are studies about this, I mean, physical attractiveness correlates quite well with intelligence, with wealth. It's all one package. If it's not the case that some people are really good at sports and some people are just really good at academics. Not really. It's usually the case that it's both. That if you're bad at one, you're probably kind of bad at the other. At the extremes, at least. I mean, I know there's many. It's, it's a very controversial thing. and People are going to disagree with me from all angles. But my point stands. I, I make a very strong point that, that put academics to a side. Forget about I, I mean intelligence. I think that bodily capacity and intelligence are strongly correlated. And in fact, in ancient medicine, in ancient psychology, this was very, very well known. It was very well known that the way people saw the mind and body was really as one whole. That, you know, your, your, it's an ancient idea that our personality, our personality type, is determined by our physiological makeup. So the humor theory, going back to, at least going back to, um, his name is passed in my mind, but uh, begins with the G, uh, Galen, right? The, the, the ancient physiologist, Galen. I think even before him, it goes probably to the Greeks and before that. That, you know, we have everything is made of fire, air, water, earth. There's these logical archetypes of source code in various combinations and proportions. In the body, those manifest as four basic substances. I think it's um, blood, uh, mucus, black and yellow bile. And this particular conglomeration and ratio then determines your actual psychology and what you're good at and what you're bad at. In short, I mean, it's an ancient idea, but most profound, like most pointedly, in the modern age, we are very obsessed with the idea of how our life and how we are determined by our genetics, how there's a predetermined factor, the idea of privilege, right? Whatever privilege, that we inherit a privilege and that we are largely determined by that. In the past, maybe the idea of the American dream dominated more. The idea that actually, no, anyone can make it. We're all fundamentally equal. We can make it, anyone, wherever you're born. I think nowadays we tend to be much more pessimistic. It's more that, well, not really, you know, you need to be born in the right place and also born in the right way. Two things together. So 
I'm not going to go too much into this particular issue. I think we all know it's like it's largely true. We know that most of our lives, at least most, is determined by things out of our control, and that our choices exist inside of this pre makeup. It's not really the case that we can break out of this entirely and create a new life. But be that as it may, it's not the point. The point is that by living life and examining ourselves, we really come to this idea that there is a source code which generates us. That we really are made up of this source code from how, however we want to express it, in terms of Galen's humorous theory, or in terms of you know DNA in our genetics, or in terms of our environment, whatever it is. That's not the point. The point is that there's a fundamental principle which is generating us, generating our body and our mind and our psychology and our makeup and our career choices and all these things. And our life is an emanation of this basic source code. What we know now, and what should be clear, is that this basic source code, whatever it is, actually doesn't change a lot. The richest and the poorest person fundamentally are not too dissonant. What makes these profound changes, and there are, there's a great diversity in the world. You have, you know, four foot pygmies in Africa and seven foot strong men in Iceland. The people, you have Einsteins and you have people who are mentally handicapped. This profound, profound variation in the human spectrum emerges from the most minute changes in the source code. That makes sense. If I go into a game and I change one line of code, we understand that it's going to ripple down and create a huge change in the simulation. Now let's abstract. By, by doing this investigation, we begin to understand what life is. It's true. This life, this world, right, the dunya, fundamentally is determined by a code out of our control. <clears throat> we can't change that. We can't really change how and where we were born, how we look, how intelligent we are, what talents we have. We can't really change these. We can work with them and around them. But what does cause these profound changes is not something big something very, very small and particular. That the most minute change in the fundamental creates the most profound change in the, in the derivative. All things around us, cosmic, human, societal, galactic, macrocosmic and microcosmic, quantum and cosmic, all things develop in stages. And each stage is the seed, is the code, the logos, upon which the next stage generates. So you have this, this seed in the center, this initial code. God says B, boom, big bang. But now this next stage, after it completes, itself is the seed which boom, next stage. And every stage grows out of the previous stage. This is a cosmological, a metaphysical principle that we learn just from living and being in the world, whether you're an academic, you're a philosopher, you like theory, and you really think deeply about this, or you're more practical, and you like to live life you know, with your hands and actually experience things yourself. Both paths are fine. And both paths, if trodden correctly, will deliver this wisdom, will give you this understanding that all of nature is cyclical, all of nature is gradual, all of nature is evolutionary. And evolution literally means to unfold, to expand. All of existence is a, is, is a process of unfolding, simple seeds and principles unfolding. The idea of the world tree, the cosmic tree, that existence itself is like a tree. 
It's a very deep idea, even a mathematical idea. In mathematics, we know that these three structures are the most fundamental. The most fundamental structure in mathematics is a set. The most basic, basic foundational layer of mathematics is called set theory. The set theory, the universe of sets, is very much a hierarchy, a tree-like hierarchy beginning with one seed and branching out. That is number. Numbers form a tree branching out from the basis, from the monad. We know this from everything around us. At every level of existence, we know this. Now, apply this to life. What then, and wherefore, is our life in the world? al dunya What does it mean? If we simply learn from all of this, and I think this is very much a Socratic argument. Socrates made this argument in, I believe, the, the, the Phaedo, where he simply looks upon the very patterns of nature. He looks upon the, the fundamental cosmic principles, peers into the logos, which generates the world, and therefore deduces what is this life. That even as we came out from a seed, even as this life, with all its complexity, with all of its terrors and grief, and also its felicity and its great happiness and wonder that it brings us, that all the great diversity of humanity, that all the colors of this spectrum, all the many different bodies and shapes and minds and personalities and great civilizations and wars and harmonies, all grows out of but a simple seed. But that this life itself should be a seed. As we know from nature, whatever grows is then the basis upon which the next thing grows. Our life that we live, if we abstract, I mean, we're not just talking about your body, we're not talking about you and your life in society. Abstract, abstract more, you're not thinking deep enough. I'm talking about your existence itself, your actual consciousness. Right? Don't ignore this. It's not a valid argument to say, when I die, you know, my body goes into the ground, my name lives on perhaps. Yes, this makes sense, right? The new generation learns from the, next, from the old generation and society continues in a cycle. You're not thinking deep enough. You're not abstracting this deep enough. Your life, whatever it is from beginning to end, this interval of consciousness exists. We know that. This existence, consciousness, your consciousness, not insofar as it relates to society, not as it relates to the world, your consciousness as it relates to you, to your soul and spirit, as we would say, right? To your fundamental essence and nature. This itself must be a seed, an egg, which cracks open and from which an, the new, the next level emerges. This is the whole idea of Life after death. Life after death, it means exactly the same thing as it does now. This life is a life after death. In fact, there's a very profound quote, a verse from the Quran, which I would have liked to bring in, but uh, I, I didn't put it in the slides, so I won't. But it's. <laughs> he who created death and created life. So to test you. Death comes before life. De death is not the absence of life. Moat. It's not the absence of life. Death is the source code which generates life. This is the ontological reality of death. Death is the name of that source code which generates your life. That's why you're right. I was dead and now I'm alive. Exactly. The game was dead, it was a black screen, and it came to life because that black screen was the source code. 
which generates the simulation. You are just witnessing the simulation. Your life at the moment is you witnessing the stream of consciousness which flows out from this fundamental principle, this seed. And this stream of consciousness itself is the seed which is going to create the next stream of consciousness. This is what all of this means put together, very simply. And this is the last scene from 2001, The Space Odyssey. Maybe that's a slight spoiler, but I, I think you should watch that, that movie. I think it's a very, very profound movie, spiritually. Do watch it. 2001, A Space Odyssey. And again, none of this is prescriptive. It is not dogmatic. You can verify everything I am saying. It's not theoretical. It's not to be confirmed, to be proven. It's not speculation. You must yourself, however, you must verify this independently through your own investigations. More than reading books, we're talking about meditation at the deepest level. I'm not talking about mindfulness meditation on whatever that app is called. I mean real meditation. Uncovering the fundamental levels of yourself. Going deeper and deeper and deep into your consciousness. The type of self-inspection which is terrifying because it involves going into the darkness, the august darkness of yourself. It means descending into the underworld and going into this psychological hellscape. You have to descend into the dark night of your soul. But over there, there will be the answers. And if you believe the answer is that all of this is nonsense, you will find that answer then. Do the same thing. That's fine. But at least verify what you're saying. At least verify it. And that's the thing which puzzles me. It can be verified. If the answer is no, it's a no. If you are so sure that this life is nothing, it's just a blip, it's just an epiphenomenon of organic matter which produces consciousness as a side effect, which lasts as long as the, the, the fundamental organic stability of the brain lasts, and when that's gone, your stream of consciousness ends and it's oblivion. And it's gone because it never really exists to begin with. It's just a, an illusion. Okay, if what you're saying is true, you will be able to verify exactly that if you studied yourself deeper enough. If that's true, when I investigated my consciousness, I should be able to find that reality. Ultimately, consciousness, looking at consciousness, will realize that it's just a product of the brain, if that's really the case. But do the work. Embark upon the path. We should all together, it's not about arrogance saying that, you know, we, I know the answer and you are wrong. If you're right, you're right. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But we should all at least, if we take this seriously, our fundamental work in life should be to study this to devote every aspect of energy that we have to really studying this and getting to the bottom of it. What is life and what is death? So let me leave this video there. This is an introduction to the ontology of life. We will revisit this many times over and go deeper and deeper. But as always, I encourage your insights, your comments. Do let me know. If you disagree, I completely welcome your disagreement. I would love to hear it. And let's leave this there, and I look forward to seeing you all next time. Assalamu alaikum.